In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I have a sermon in here somewhere. <laughs> Today is the first day, the first Sunday in this holy season of Lent. And I need to make an apology to you before I begin the sermon, because I'm not going to be preaching on the texts that are appointed for this day. I've been an ordained minister for 52 years now, and it's very, very rare that I do not preach on the texts. Um, but sometimes something comes up. Something happens in the church or in the world that I simply need to talk about. I think it's that important. Uh, and so I go off text for that Sunday. And this is, this is one of those occasions. I'm going to be talking, however, about something that is very Lenten, and that is holy baptism. Uh, Lent, we know, is, as a season of penitence, but it is also the ancient season for the preparation of candidates for baptism. And then people could be baptized at the great vigil of Easter on Holy Saturday. So I'm a little bit on target, OK? Um, but I need to talk about baptism today for a really important reason. A number of years ago, I was at a conference, and the speaker at the conference was the late Dr. Eric Gritsch, who was a prominent Luther scholar um, and a church historian of note. And at this conference, he was asked, what, what is the role of the Lutheran church in the church Catholic? In the whole Christian community, what is our job? Do we have a specific job? And Dr. Gritch didn't even have to think about it. He, he knew exactly what the answer was to that question as soon as the man asked it. And his answer was, Lutherans are to be the Doberman pinchers of the gospel. <laughs> right? And what he was talking about is that in the church, we have a tendency to take the gospel, which is the free gift of God, and turn it back into a law to make it a work that we have to do and that depends on us. We like to do that, but it destroys the gospel. And so Dr. Gritch was saying, when that happens, we bark. And sometimes, if it's bad enough, we even bite in order to protect the integrity of the gospel. There was an item that was covered fairly prominently in the news five, six weeks ago. Some of you may have read about this. It's an event that took place in a Roman Catholic parish in Arizona. The priest of that parish, he had been there for 17 years, but he wanted, when they baptized people, he wanted the people to realize that not only was he baptizing them, but that the whole community was standing with them that the community was sponsoring them and that they could rely on the community. So he's made a slight change to the, to the right. Instead of saying, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, he said, we baptize you in the name of the Father and so on. He changed the pronoun from singular to plural. The Vatican in Rome found this problematical. They removed him from that parish. Okay, that's bad enough. They said, he can't, you can't change the right. All right. I can see the Vatican, I can see bishops saying, don't fool around with the rights, leave the rights alone. I can see that. But they went further. They said every baptism that that priest performed in 17 years in that parish was declared to be invalid. <laughs> and that those people would have to be rebaptized. 
they didn't say what was going to happen to people who had died in that period. The change of the pronoun from singular to plural invalidated those people, in other words, had not been joined to Christ. When they were baptized, it had to all be done over again. When I heard about this, it reminded me of something in the early church. It was a controversy in the early church known as the rigorist controversy. And in this controversy, the question was asked, what if the person performing the sacraments is unrighteous? What if he's a bad person, evil, an adulterer or a criminal? And there was one group in the early church called the rigorists who said, well, any sacrament that he conducted is invalid because he was unrighteous. The church at that time said no to that. First of all, because it understood that we are all unrighteous. We are all sinners, so there would not be the possibility of a valid sacrament. Now, today, this is a little different what happened in Arizona. It wasn't about whether he was morally upstanding. He evidently was. The people loved him. So the question became, does the ritual perfection of the priest's administration of the sacrament determine the validity of the sacrament? And the Vatican said, Yes, he has to do it exactly right, or else it's not a valid sacrament. Lutherans become Doberman pinchers at this point and say, no. We agree with the Roman Catholic Church, by the way, that the congregation does not confect to the sacrament. Neither does the priest. The sacrament is confected by God. God is the one who determines the validity of a sacrament. The congregation and the priest are merely God's agents, God's conduits. I have a lot of Roman Catholic relatives, and one of the things that went through my mind when I heard this pronouncement from the Vatican is I wondered whether every Roman Catholic person wasn't waking up the next morning and thinking, well, what if the priest made a mistake in my baptism? What if he had a migraine that day or was hung over? Not unknown, by the way. <laughs> what if he was in a bad mood or lazy? Or maybe he was elderly like me and forgot to do stuff. So I, I wondered whether every Roman Catholic wasn't worrying, is my sacrament valid? If it has to be done just right, if you can't even miss the pronoun. We Lutherans insist that the sacrament depends only on one thing, God's gracious will toward us. And God will overlook far greater errors than the correct pronoun. Besides, if the queen can say we, why can't God? From my point of view as a Lutheran, what happened on that day when this Vatican pronouncement came down is that they leached all the grace out of the sacrament. It was no longer a gracious gift. It was now a law, a rule, something you had to do exactly right or else. When I was in seminary, we were once in a class on liturgy and we asked the professor, what, hap what would happen if we were in a place where there was no ordained person, 
and there was no water. And we were with a person who had been mortally injured and they were dying. And they said, they grabbed your hand and they said, I don't want to die unbaptized. I'm unbaptized, help me. We said to our professor, what do we do? There's no ordained person, there's no water, we're in the desert. He said, well, first of all, in an emergency, anyone can perform a baptism. All nurses know that, by the way. In a case of emergency, anyone can perform a baptism. They don't even have to be baptized themselves. The second problem, of course, was no water. He said, well, use sand. You're in the desert. He said, God will count it. We have a loving God. We have a gracious God. Now, I want to switch tracks a little bit here to one of the other sacraments, but I'm hoping it will illuminate what I'm trying to get across today, which is grace, and that our lives as Christians from the Lutheran point of view are all about what God does, not what we do. God's love, not our perfection or righteousness or correct performance of anything. So I want to switch for a minute over to the sacrament that we're about to perform here the Holy Eucharist. Now, the Lutheran Church has a teaching about the Holy Eucharist that is not held by a lot of other, especially Protestant churches. And that is that when we celebrate the Eucharist, Jesus Christ is really present. Really present with his body in the bread and his blood in the wine. Now, we do not claim that that explains the sacrament because we don't believe it can be explained. We don't believe in Holy Communion because we can explain it. We believe it because Jesus promised it. At the Last Supper, he said, eat this bread. It is my body. Drink this cup. It is my blood for you. He promised it. We believe it. And we like to leave it at that. But the other denominations of Christianity have tried to figure it out, and they wanted it to be rational. They wanted it to be explainable. So, for example, the Zwinglians, who are located mostly in Zurich, Switzerland, Zwingli, their leader, said, well, the way we can explain this is the presence of Christ in the sacrament is a memorial presence. He's not really there but we're remembering him. It's a memorial present. We remember the Last Supper. We remember the crucifixion. And that, that memory is what makes the sacrament important. Now, other Protestants found that too weak, not just Lutherans. The Calvinists also find that, found that too weak an image. And so Calvin came up with something else. He said, well, he's not really present in the bread and the wine, but he's spiritually present when we celebrate this sacrament. His spirit is with us. Uh, Luther's response, now I'm kind of paraphrasing him, his response was whoop-de-doo. <laughs> He's always spiritually present. <laughs> so how is the sacrament special? The uh, novelist Flannery O'Connor, who was Roman Catholic, once said, I wouldn't cross the street for a spiritual presence. <laughs> the Roman Catholic Church agrees with us about real presence, but again, there was this need to explain it. And so they created the doctrine of transubstantiation, which explained the presence of Christ using Aristotelian philosophical terminology. Luther said, that's a mistake. It's better if we just say we can't explain it rather than use Aristotle. Aristotle's going to run out of gas someday. He has already, you know. Luther liked the Eastern Orthodox churches. In the Eastern Orthodox church, they don't refer to these events as holy sacraments. They refer to them as the holy mysteries. And Luther liked that. We can't explain what's going on here. It's a mystery. God is a mystery. 
we shouldn't overstep ourselves. Now, the next thing for you to know is that we are in full communion with almost all of these churches who have, from our point of view, an, a deficient explanation, a deficient description of the sacrament. They don't like real presence, we do. But we're still in full communion with them. Well, how can that be? The one church we're not in full communion with, of course, is the Roman Catholic Church. That's not our fault. We're willing to be. They're not willing to have us. But any Roman Catholic who comes to this church is welcome at this altar, right? When I was a young man, getting hard, harder and harder to remember those days, but when I was a young man in my first congregation in Plymouth, Massachusetts, I served on the Lutheran Roman Catholic dialogue in New England. And one month we were meeting and we were discussing this issue of Eucharistic hospitality. And the Roman Catholic theologians said, sharing the Eucharist together is the lure, right? We all want to share the Eucharist together and that makes us work harder at reaching an agreement. Because once we reach an agreement, then we can have Holy Communion together. It's the lure. And we Lutherans on the panel said, no, that's not how the Eucharist works. We think that what happens is that Christ at his table overrules all our debates. He doesn't say don't have the debates. Debates can be useful. We can learn from them. But he says, leave them outside the church door when we come to communion and then gather around the table, join your hands, and I will make you one. You will not make each other one by coming to some kinds of agreement because they don't last. I doubt that we could find agreement for the people sitting in this congregation today on a lot of issues, including religious ones. If agreement becomes what gets us to the altar, we're in trouble, folks. So the way we, talk, we spoke to the theologians that night, the Roman Catholic theologians, is we said, do you remember when you were kids and you were sitting down to dinner and you were fighting with your brother and your mother would say, not at the table. Remember those things? I think that happened to most of us at one time or another. Well, our Lutheran view is that Jesus is saying to us, not at the table. At this table, despite all your arguments, despite all your disagreements, you're one. Your brothers, your sisters, your family, act like it. Share my meal, which I am giving you, not the church. We Lutherans call this sola gratia, grace alone. We live by grace alone. So whenever people come to this table desiring communion with Jesus Christ, he'll show up. Whether we have the best theology or the best ritual or not, we Lutherans think that real presence is better way of talking about the Eucharist than those other options. But we have no doubt that our theology does not explain, it does not crack the mystery, it does not have the final word. It's still a mystery. But Christ will show up. He will show up out of grace. He will show up out of his love for his crazy, disputatious children. <laughs> That's us. No, I don't want you to think, as I say all this, that I don't care about doing things correctly. 
I'm an old-fashioned pre-Vatican II high churchman. That's the way I was raised, and I can't let go of it now. By the way, I really miss Vince Gus, you know, because he was one too. Sometimes I feel like we're the last of the Mohicans. You know, we're, we're just dying out here. And when I talk about this with other pastors, they say, what? <laughs> what, what are you talking about? We, we don't, we're beyond that nowadays. And, and maybe that's good, but I'm not beyond it. So I love being with Vince because he cheered me on. But I really care about good theology. And I really care about good liturgy. I want the church to do it well so that it communicate the gospel well. They are important. All right? But thank God. The validity of the sacraments does not depend on theology or liturgy. God comes to us out of sheer love for us, even when we do the ritual badly. Even if we say we instead of I. God doesn't mind. God will be there. And God will overrule the legalists who demand perfection. That's my Doberman Pinscher sermon. <laughs> Amen. <laughs>